Thank you very much, Chris. I'm very proud of you and what you've done and what you're doing still. So stay there. <laughs> Keep it up. <laughs> it really is amazing what uh, happened in the early 60s and the way it developed. And uh, I would like to do this through a whole a series of uh, photographs to uh, project them and then talk about them. If we have the first slide, please. As we go through the whole process of, uh, of the Apollo missions to the moon and what did happen and how, what was my role in the whole thing. And <clears throat> one of the things that we'd like to uh, emphasize is the fact that, next, is the fact that the, uh, <clears throat> the interest of human beings in the moon goes back thousands of years as, some, as we talked here about the fact that the ancient Egyptians had a goddess with Khinsu to about the, about the moon and it was very important where the moon is and what, what, what the shape of the moon is and all of this had been uh, very significant to them. All the way through, throughout history the moon had a position in the human mind and the first time that we actually got some view of the moon, next, is the is the map that was first made by Galileo Galilei in Italy where he trained the very first telescope to see the moon and actually saw all kinds of little things that, that, that varied and in addition to the black areas on the moon he saw some high ground and he began to name the features of the moon he called the flat black areas Maria because they are like the seas, like the, the, the Latin term mare is for sea. And then the bright areas he called terra, from the, meaning the land, so he, he imagined it to be like the earth. So the flat areas, he called them seas, naturally, and the, or, or the, high, uh, the, the white areas, he called them the, the mountains, the terra, the mountain ranges. And then he picked up the mountain ranges, he called them the Alps, and the Apennines and so on, mount after mountains of the, of the earth. So this was our first view of the, of the features of the moon in, nine, in 1610, the year 1610, when Galileo Galilei looked by, through his telescope to see these features of the moon. Next. And then 250 years later, Jules Verne, thought about the trip to and the sending men to the moon and it's fascinating that he thought that there will be three men going to the moon and then the spacecraft would look like this <laughs> lo and behold it looks very much like the, the command module <laughs> a hundred years later we have something different from uh, something uh, new but it certainly looked very much like that. Next, please. And there came NASA to divide, to divide a scheme, but sending missions to the moon with exactly the same kind, three men within the, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a little capsule that looks like the command module. And actually, I took this picture to uh, Rocco Patron, which I will talk about in a minute. And he said, well, we must have all thought about that when we were young. And it, things like this stick to the mind, which is very true. <clears throat> the reason for the huge success for NASA, perhaps to this day, is this gentleman right here. And it's called, his name is Jim Webb, James Webb. And Jim Webb was the first uh, uh, NASA administrator. He was there only for six or seven years. And he is the one that, that kind of shaped the... Uh, NASA uh, theory and the NASA uh, wor workforce and the NASA do uh, way of doing things. And <clears throat> I heard from uh, Rocco Patron, which I'll talk about in a minute, about how Jim Webb dealt with his people and particularly the bosses of the, his people. He said, Rocco said, when I became a supervisor, uh, uh, Jim Webb collected us all and he said, uh, Listen, you guys, you became supervisors, which means that from now on, you don't do any work. <laughs> and he said, well, we'll stop like this and say what you, what does he mean by this? He said, you don't do any work because your job from this day forward is to make sure 
that each and every man that works for you, that no, there were no women, no men, no women in NASA at all. That, but you, you have to make sure that you have, you can get every man that works for you to do more than what they think they are capable of doing. Only then we'll make it to the moon. Because if every man does what he thinks he's going to do, we'll fail. Surely fail will never make it. But every man that works for you, if you can encourage them, push them, prod them, to get to do more what they think they are capable of doing, then we'll make it to the moon. I think that statement can help any organization anywhere in the world. What is the, what is the supervisor's job? Next. <coughs> Next was the, the to make sure that that happens. We were lucky to have this gentleman, Werner von Braun, who was a rocket scientist who came from uh, Germany. And uh, thank God he joined the American troops after he, or he escaped and joined the Americans when he knew that America is winning the war, Second World, Second World War. And he became the man that actually designed the spacecraft and looked for all, all, all along. And he's the one behind the design of the Saturn V uh, uh, rocket, which allowed the mission to the moon to succeed as it did. Next, please. And the third pillar of NASA then was the uh, Apollo program director, Rocco Patron. Rocco was a, a very tough guy. Uh, an army engineer who, who worked with an, who got an, a master's degree in, uh, in at MIT, so he worked very hard, and he was certainly one man to 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 know how to do things. Uh, he told me once after we left the program, after we both left NASA for three years, love, this was the fact that uh, Farouk, you know, when we were working on the uh, Apollo missions and so on. Three directors of three programs, of NASA programs before the Apollo program, came to me and see me in the office. And they said, how can you allow the, an Egyptian to be the secretary of landing site selection? This guy could be a plant from the Russians. The Soviets are all over Egypt. <laughs> The Soviets could have sent him specifically to mess up the Apollo program, especially in the landing site selection. If he selects the, the place where the astronauts would crash, then we'll, we'll, the program would be dead. So he made me a, 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 a plant to do this. And he said, I told them, <clears throat> I did not put him in this job. It was his own fellow geologist that elected him the secretary of that committee. Don't tell me where he came from. Give me some one thing that he did wrong, and I will throw him out the window with my own hands. He said, then they left. And then he said, I never told you that story, so that would not affect your performance. See the, 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 uh, the beauty of the mind. And uh, Rocco became a man that really had his finger on every little speck of the Apollo program. He would say the, the, the NASA Houston guys are claiming that there's something, something that they cannot do right and this, some, there are going to be delays and whatnot. Farouk, you go down, go down to Houston tomorrow and find out what is the problem with such and such. So I travel to, to uh, uh, Houston and go down and between the, in, the, in the little offices and they find out exactly what the story and they go and find that John doing, he has six people and this and that, and, but his boss doesn't want him to work on this thing. And he can do it, and therefore it will result in a delay or something. So I go back to Washington and tell him the story. So I said, okay, did you have his number? He said, Virginia, the secretary was named Virginia. Virginia, come on, call this number. And then he calls this little engineer in Houston, and he says, hey, John, Farouk here tells me that you're doing a great job. Listen, John, the whole Apollo program depends on your job. You're doing the one thing that you're going to do. I want you to get your people together and tell them that your job, that they, the whole Apollo program stands on one foot until you, you find that you fix this job. Come on, do it. And, and if you need any help, call me. If you have any problem at night, here is my home number. 
to, to, and I'm sure the other guy, the guy, this John at the other, other end in Houston would be trembling with, it, with the Apollo program director is calling him from Washington. <laughs> None of his bosses in, at Houston had ever talked to him. <laughs> so he would, he, would be, he would go and do that job in two days and fix it instantly like this. So this was a, the style of management that's vastly different from anything I had never seen or, and I, or I had never seen since. So these people were, were, were like that, and they, they knew how to, uh, to, to encourage the, uh, the, the, the workforce, and especially since the, the workforce was very young. Once we were down in uh, the Apollo 11 time, I was talking with a bunch of astronauts and we're looking at the people that are running the mission during the Apollo 11 mission, and we said, dear God in heaven, they look very young. And we said, okay, let's go and see the average age of these people. So we went down the hall of the and said, ask them, what's your... What, how old are you? We we'll write it down. How old are you? Get the numbers and how old they were. And we found out that the, the median, the average age of the people that are running the Apollo missions during the mission, the, the critical most uh, mission was 26 years old. And real, that depending on youth and therefore because you encourage them and you push them and you give them the responsibility and they feel good and they say, my God, I will do this, that, that. Each one of them believes that he is running the, the whole damn mission. And they <laughs> and make, keep them thinking it this way and keep pushing them and they do the wonders. Next please. And therefore, uh, we had uh, three things to have to done before the Apollo missions to the moon. First, there was a ranger program where they sent a spacecraft to hit the surface of the moon and to see how the impact of something like this would cause. Next. And this is what the, so the, so the, uh, one of the things that we wanted to do actually was to get, as far as we concerned, the geologists could get pictures of the approach of this little thing that is going to impact on the moon so that we can see details of the features of the moon as the, as the rocket approaches. <coughs> Next. And the second uh, program was called the, the surveyor program, whereby the, we wanted to make absolutely certain that the, 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 the spacecraft can actually land. <clears throat> because there were so many people, including some very loud scientists, that said that the moon, because of the, uh, in the continued bombardment by meteorites, the surface of the moon would be covered by a layer of dust. And the spacecraft is Apollo 11 is going to come like this and will go down and blah, 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 it will just disappear into that dust. And <laughs> one of them, Tommy Gold, was, would be writing uh, letters to the president, to the senate, to the, and every, everybody that would even read. And he had a position in, at the university and he had a name and so people were terrified in many ways that they questioned our intellect about the fact that we thought that the moon was rocky and it will stand everything so there will be, there was a necessity to actually prove that there is something that can be sent from the earth to actually land on the moon and stay put, not disappear in the dust. And that was the surveyor program. Next. So there were several uh, uh, missions to uh, land on the surface of the moon and actually take pictures to show that, yes, indeed, the surface of the moon is hard enough to land and there are, there are rocks that can actually stand on the surface. Next. And the last item was the lunar orbiter. And the lunar orbiter program was the most significant of all of it because it's just uh, we sent something to up to go to the moon and and rotate around the moon and take pictures and then relay them, and the and that relaying was done through Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and we have here uh, with us tonight uh, Tom Young and Tom Young was uh, at Langley Research Center and he was responsible for getting us together for to select uh, sites for. Uh, Lunar Orbiter uh, uh, missions and the Lunar Orbiter brought us so many photographs that we could look at and interpret and figure out exactly what it is and therefore we could figure where to land the Apollo missions one by one based on the photographs that so the, the next please so the images of the uh, of Lunar Orbiter allowed us to photograph as much of the the uh, near surface, the, the near side of the moon, as much as we possibly can with both the dark areas, which are the maria, the basalts, the volcanics, as well as the terra, the high, the high uh, ground. Next. So we began to think about what, uh, what uh, the features of the, the moon might be and the, the missions as we go through them one by one. 